morning, and thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here this morning to talk to you about some of my thoughts about how climate change uh, will affect manure management systems with respect to uh, dairy operations primarily. I want to acknowledge the uh, uh, skewing of the slide uh, program here. Just kidding. I would acknowledge some of my colleagues that uh, I talked to and shared some information with me as I uh, prepared this, uh, this talk. Thanks, David. Peter Wright, many of you know from USDA NRCS. He's a state engineer in New York State. Uh, a close colleague, Kurt Gooch at, at Cornell. Another close colleague, Quirin Ketterings, who's a soil scientist. And then a postdoc who's working with us, Amir Setapur, who's uh, doing some work <clears throat> excuse me, on climate change. Ish, issues uh, from field applications of manure. So as I prepared for this, this talk, this is not an area that I necessarily spend a lot of my day thinking about, uh, typically. There's a number of assumptions that uh, we have to deal with, obviously. Clearly, climate is changing, and whether anyone expects it to continue to do so is um, uh, maybe not uh, completely relevant. It has changed. It is changing. My assumptions here are that the change will track the models that are that are being projected out. Some places clearly are going to be wetter. Some are going to be drier. Pretty much overall, the rainfall intensity is expected to be uh, greater, whether you're drier or not, um, from what I could observe in uh, my research for this this talk. More rainfall in winter and spring in the northern United States. Uh, our summers are going to get generally drier. Again, that higher rainfall and intensity does not necessarily mean more rain for crops. All of these things are going to affect um, how we react and adjust with our manure systems. We uh, are seeing and will expect it to continue to see longer frost-free periods and, of course, the change that uh, all of us are experiencing in the various places that we work and farm will not be uniform uh, across uh, the U.S. and around the world, for that matter. So as I, again, looked at some of the literature using the climate change in agriculture in the United States document put out by USDA, they referenced seven different issues for agriculture. And the ones that I focus on here that I thought were most relevant for manure uh, systems and the impacts are going to be water and temperature. And I largely ignore, perhaps to my peril, but I largely ignore uh, the other items uh, for, for the purposes of this discussion here over the next few minutes. There are some other things that I want to point out that, uh, again, as I'm thinking about this topic, the, the topic is primarily the impact of climate change on manure management. How is climate going to change going to affect manure management? But we also have to be aware of and thoughtful about the impact that manure management is going to have on climate change. And some of Dr. Rotz's information um, showing how we're modeling uh, different uh, changes in our manure management systems, those are also going to have an effect on climate change. And in fact, policy may be driving our operations to make uh, some changes, even as they're adjusting their overall operation to climate change. And another theme that seems to be coming up here um, also in Dr. Rotz's and previous presentations is an awareness of mitigation conflicts and the influence that policy or um, the consumer uh, retail chain can have on decisions, right or wrong. We can't optimize all of these things. We can't look at climate change or its impact on a manure handling system in a vacuum and we can't expect all of the different impacts to have the same weight and priority. And how we sort that out, I think, is going to be really important going forward. You, most of you have seen maps like this um, showing here uh, climate predict predictions uh, for um, winter, spring, summer, and fall. And this is for later in this century. And you can see most of the northern tier of the US for winter and spring are, going to, are predicted to be wetter. Um, and then summer, we've got some areas here in the coastal area that's going to be much drier. It looks like the southeast. 
uh, are going to have drier winters and springs. And again, how those, those impacts are going to have important uh, effects on our manure systems. Again, another key piece here is temperature change under the lower emission scenario. Most of the country is going to get a few degrees warmer under these model predictions. And under the higher emission scenarios, much of the country, except for maybe the coastal areas, will see very dramatic uh, temperature changes, which will have significant impacts, of course. And then again, just another key piece that I wanted to point out, the, uh, already the observed increase in frost-free season length in various portions of the U.S. have been significant, particularly in the West, and the projections uh, show even greater increase in frost-free season. Um, uh, those those uh, changes will continue. So what do these things mean uh, for, uh, the, in a practical perspective, on the dairy farm? Talk about housing first for just a few moments. Uh, higher temperatures and higher humidities to the extent that that goes along with it is going to increase the heat stress on those very large animals. Um, I'm, I'm thinking, well, maybe that means we're going to have even a stronger push toward uh, barn systems away from, away from the open dry lot types of systems so that we can control that environment, that production environment a little bit better for, for those animals, do some ventilation and, and cooling in those barns seems to me that that's going to mean more water use if we're using misters or uh, water to cool the animals um, and maybe uh, affect water use in other ways if we're creating flush barns. It also means more manure is going to be collected. Um, wet systems uh, are going to be part of that picture. We're maybe going to get more um, methane uh, generation due to that manure storage. Um, but maybe less nitrous oxide. And if you look at a slide here based on some EPA emissions charts, um, anaerobic lagoons versus daily spread versus liquid systems versus a storage, solid storage and dry lots have about a 20 times higher nitrous oxide emissions factor um, for that manure handling system. So while we, if we're storing more manure, we will increase uh, perhaps methane production from that system perhaps a shift from a dry lot to more manure storage has some offsetting uh, component to, to that by lowering nitrous oxide emissions. So when we talk about manure storage, if we're going to have a logger storage term, I know some producers in New York are thinking increasingly they want maybe nine months of storage to avoid a range of um, other environmental issues associated with manure application, especially in uh, challenging winters like we've had uh, the last two years in New York. Um, in fact, I, I have to say, one of the photos I was hoped to get for this talk was a, uh, as I go uh, skiing, there's a house that I pass, and uh, right next to the snowbank, the house has a sign that says climate change denier, as we've experienced one of the coldest winters on record in New York. Um, that tends to add to people's, if they're, if they're uh, uh, a bit doubtful about this whole thing. Um, we respond to uh, a few weeks of cold weather makes people even, even bigger doubters in some respects. But um, so uh, manure storage, longer term, are we going to have to have store for longer periods? Well, that's going to depend on our winter precip and temperature. Although I heard a talk here a couple days ago at this conference that really raised the question about nitrous oxide emissions from fall um, manure applications and makes me wonder whether uh, any winter application is going to be uh, reasonable in the northern tier of states. Um, anyway, can we keep crops actively growing? That may allow us to spread manure in the winter. Um, but again, I'm not sure about our fall and winter applications. We may have to curtail or eliminate those in a lot of situations. If we're storing more manure, we may have to have more freeboard, so larger storages, longer storage period means larger storage, more freeboard if we're dealing with uh, higher intensity, uh, higher precip storms, and I, presumably that would go for the arid regions as well as the humid regions. If these storms are, are more intense and uh, we have to capture higher rainfall amounts even if it's um, uh, not distributed as well as it has been in the past. The other thing is planning for average rainfall and um, in terms of a storage structure. Some of the work that uh, um, NRCS in New York is doing, they're shifting 
from um, planning for the average rainfall to more intensive rainfall. I apologize, this slide does not show up very well, but this is a typical cross-sectional design of a waste storage structure um, for, uh, for an NRCS purposes. And you can see here we have a portion of that storage is reserved for um, holding uh, precipitation, uh, the average precipitation that's expected during the storage period. And uh, that may have to get significantly larger. I'm going to skip through a couple of slides here, just some uh, map showing uh, uh, changes, the uh, f rainfall for the 90 percent uh, precip from uh, November through April, so six month storage versus uh, October through May or an eight month storage. And this slide here again from Peter Wright from NRCS shows some calculations for a straight sided storage, six months for a 500 cow dairy with these parameters here. Um, by going from planning for the average storm to the 90 percent storm, our storage gets a little bit bigger. But if we go from, uh, if we force farms to go from a six month storage to an eight month storage, the uh, storage is 50% larger. And then if you plan for the 90% rainfall collection, your storage more, well more than doubles. So for any given farm size, any number of cattle, storage period, uh, as that increases and as we plan for bigger storms, that substantially increases the size of the storage at least in uncovered situations. And then if we slope the size of that storage, which our larger earthen systems typically are, we can get even uh, um, more significant. Um, so this, this storage here with a slope side for that same number of cows, eight months at the 90% storm is uh, more than twice what it was for a straight-sided storage. So these get pretty large pretty fast. So this makes me think about, well, if we're going to have to collect all this additional water, why don't we try to avoid collecting that water? And we, then we start to think about storage covers um, to exclude the precipitation or to keep the, cl the water clean. Um, so those covers allow more space for manure. Maybe we don't have to collect for the CAFO-related 25-24 storm. And again, we don't have to collect for that, uh, the precipitation for the design period. So we can reserve more space in a storage for manure. In an arid region, maybe that means you uh, pump to a covered uh, infiltration area to um, return that uh, water, capture that water, return it to the ground, or you store it for livestock processing and usage. Human regions, we may, maybe we're going to pump that to clean water storage to irrigate. Um, but maybe we have plenty of water and it's just a, a matter of um, reserving that space for manure, keeping the clean water out of it. More on storage covers um, may allow us to manage ammonia volatilization, which is an issue that's, uh, not necess that's not directly greenhouse gas related, but an important one nevertheless. We can reduce or eliminate evaporation with the storage cover, but we're going to have to capture and flare the methane uh, obviously to address the uh, carbon footprint element of um, covering that storage. So again, recovering precipitation uh, that falls on that storage cover for the cattle or uh, allowing it to infiltrate and um, with hopefully with the right to pull some of that water back out of the ground to either water cattle or feed water our crops. Also wondering if we're going to have to have uh, more storage liners in the future. Um, the uh, recent case here in Yakima uh, really calls into question some of, uh, some of our manure storage design uh, systems relevant, relative to earthen uh, geolined systems. If we're putting liners in, we may have to uh, get better at pre-harvesting pre the solids or figure out uh, better ways to remove uh, the settled solids. Land application is going to take, uh, have some impacts as well, not only in terms of the timing, but uh, narrower timing windows require that we have greater capacity to move manure, so that means larger tankers and more of them or more pumping capacity, more people, more um, equipment um, to move more manure in uh, narrower windows of time. Um, some of you know Brad Jorn from uh, Purdue. This is a picture from Purdue, attributed to Purdue from 1997. 
Many of you know Brad is very entrepreneurial. I, I suspect this may have been one of Brad's early entrepreneurial endeavors. Um, good thing he's not here. He would take me out on that one. But um, anyway, this really doesn't, right, it, 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 solves, it solves a problem, but it really doesn't address the problem, does it? So uh, are we going to have uh, wetter, uh, less winter? If they're wetter, we are definitely not going to be able to spread manure in these types of conditions. So in terms of land application, I think for a variety of reasons, we're going to need more injection of manure. Um, that significantly reduces the runoff exposure and our ammonia loss, but it also lowers our rates, which means we're going to need more acreage, more land base to properly recycle those nutrients. And I couldn't find a picture, but we're probably going to want um, lower disturbance methods. I know they exist, but uh, lower disturbance methods of injection than are represented here in the photos that I have. We'll be looking at other, uh, other um, forms of land application. This is a, a unit uh, based on a Dutch system, the Veinhouse system, if anybody has seen that. And so we have a farm here that's uh, drag hosing manure with the vein house system into a uh, hay after first cutting. Um, you can use non-anaerobic digested manure and the odors are, the guy standing there right next to that application uh, hardly knows that uh, undigested manure is being applied. It's really remarkable in terms of the odor control. Um, but we may be doing a lot more of this uh, around the country as uh, we go forward because we'll have to be applying more, more manure during the growing season when the crops are in a position to take up those nutrients. Okay. So another type of innovation here, this is an experimental system that, uh, that a producer in, in New York is, is working on. He calls it a nutrient boom. Some of you may have seen some of the press on this, but it, it's uh, basically pulled through the field with a hard hose traveler and in uh, well, well established crop of corn, it has uh, um, drop tubes that drizzle manure uh, on the ground underneath that canopy. So again, just another way to do in-season application potentially. Um, some of the things we're going to have to be confronted with in terms of uh, nitrous oxide emissions, I'm going to just jump right to this slide here and show that um, manure rates for optimal nitrogen and fertilizer rates produced about the same amount of um, uh, nitrous oxide emissions and were highest as compared to other, whoops, other methods that we used where we're just managing um, manure for phosphorus levels and other and compost, but they also produce the higher, highest yields. So we have to keep into, keep into mind that um, looks like manure and fertilizer are showing similar emissions uh, um, results from nitrous oxide, which is, I suppose, a good thing. Um, but we're going to have to keep these rates up to keep our yields high so that we can feed the animals and do a better job of recycling uh, nutrients around that farm system. On the, on the crop side, obviously higher uh, maximum temperatures uh, can increase yields in some cases. Higher crop yields might increase manure rates, but um, higher minimum temperatures reduce yields. So higher nighttime temperatures can reduce yields according to the literature. Um, and where you exceed op the optimum, you can sharply reduce, reduce yields. So uh, again, we, there might be changes uh, to carrying capacity of the land base. If our yields are driven lower, our manure rates are going to have to be driven accordingly and it may drive um, either more land base or more export of manure nutrients to properly manage those. Okay. Um, another potential result of uh, crop yields, depending on where you are in the world, is maybe warmer winter, winter temperatures are going to allow us to produce uh, a nice crop of uh, winter cereals growing through the winter, um, more crop uptake and agronomic utilization of our manure nutrients may offset and allow us to apply, as I said, more application of manure during the winter. It's really going to depend on where you are and what your situation is. And that's, that's a point I want to go back. If we look at the, the modeling that Dr. Rotz was showing, I think that's critical that we do that. And it's also critical that we understand that what might 
be the best combination of uh, things in New York is going to be different than Wisconsin, going to be different than uh, Texas Panhandle or whatever. And we have to acknowledge those and help farmers make the best decisions for their resources that they have. Um, okay, keep moving. Some of the challenges if we're relying more on uh, in the wetter areas and in-season application of nutrients is sometimes the season isn't going to be cooperative for us. And you can't see this very well, but this is uh, supposed to be knee-high corn. It's, it's water stressed, it's yellow, and the streams are up. And this is a period where we've gotten a lot of rain. And if you're relying on putting your manure and your nitrogen on in this kind of condition, you're going to have some serious problems. So. Um, there are some drawbacks, obviously, to re, uh, applying nutrients uh, during the growing season. In, in terms of the west and crops and water, obviously some major management challenges we've heard today, and, and most of us are aware that there's uh, reduced snowpack and it's melting faster and that's expected to continue. Um, and, uh, but our crop water use is going to increase as we get less, right, um, precipitation, natural precipitation in some of these areas. So focusing on drought tolerant crops, uh, lower water requirement crops, and water recovery are going to be parts of uh, the puzzle here as well. Don't need to belabor this in terms of uh, conserving water use. Um, one of the things that we also need to think about here as well is soil quality and the effect of climate change on soil quality and how that radiates back up into the operation. So if we're in these drier conditions, obviously we're more prone to wind erosion. Um, conversely, if you have higher, higher intensity rainfall, those, that's going to be more erosive uh, for our soils. Are we going to need to have more grass filter areas in some of these higher rainfall areas, which um, may mean loss of crop or loss of productivity? Warmer temperatures are going to re um, increase the rate of organic matter loss and decline, so managing soil carbon levels are going to be critical. A lot of, oper a lot of dairy operations talk about exporting nutrients uh, through, the, through solids, the solids, exporting of solids for composting or other uses. But I think that's another thing that we're going to have to call into question is uh, exporting our solids when we may, to the extent that we have cropping systems on a dairy farm, we may want to keep the solids, keep the carbon in the system and find other ways to deal with um, nutrients. So as I'm thinking, more barns, more collected manure, more manure storage, either lower rates and more land or more exporting of manure, I'm thinking liners and covers are going to be in the future, uh, a narrower land application windows, more application equipment, increased costs, and then I have to start to think about advanced treatment systems to try to help us address and adjust um, all of these other things that are being uh, pressed upon us, I guess, through, through climate change and other environmental uh, related efforts on, on uh, farms, dairies and otherwise. And so I don't want to um, belabor this one too much, but perhaps we have an anaerobic digester, uh, multiple uh, series of separators, perhaps even reverse osmosis or some similar um, treatment leading to uh, drinkable water for the cattle or usable in other places. So advanced treatment systems uh, maybe a lot, might allow us to recover 50, 60 percent, perhaps more. Um, of, of water from the manure, and perhaps we can use that if we treat it uh, as far as RO, we can use that to water the cattle and uh, some other things. There's a lot of options. It depends on the goals. Then the costs are the major challenge here, clearly. And obviously, it's not good for farmers. Um, uh, they can't afford very many white elephants in their businesses, so um, there's a a lot of interest in looking at these systems and investing in them, but many farmers are reluctant to do so for very appropriate business reasons. Um, so if I, again, I look at the whole system, I'm thinking, you know, we're going to need to do a better job of feeding our cattle, uh, continue to improve and build on the work that's been done on precision feeding of the animals to reduce NMP excretion. That means um, 
our life cycle analysis and mass flows and some of the terms that uh, you've heard from some of the previous speakers this morning are, are very similar. We need to understand, continue to build our understanding of the mass flows of nutrients as they flow through our handling systems, the nutrient losses and transformations that occur, where are the critical control points, how do we use our nutrients most efficiently, and then we're going to land apply those um, to crop uptake uh, in relation to the land base and then export extra nutrients off the farm. And we need to know what goes on at each step in order to, to manage the outcomes and make the best decisions possible. I think it's important, um, again, we've got technically feasible uh, solutions for advanced treatment systems. Are they economically feasible? I think that's, we're working on that, but we need to continue to press forward in uh, value engineering type efforts. I think it's important for public policy to, and um, to continue to invest in not only programs and efforts like what we're uh, experiencing here at this event, but also um, invest in some actual hardware and get some of these, more of these systems out in, uh, in farms, working on farms so that they can be better documented and we can understand all the impacts going through the system. So in the future, we have to continue to press and figure out how to, how to address that triple bottom line, not only the economics, but the environmental component and all the competing interests within the environmental component, as well as the social interests in what we're doing. Um, I guess water, water, water is, is really the issue. Um, we have to be aware that our regulations tend to be topically and jurisdictionally compartmentalized. I don't, know, I don't want to try to say that three times fast, but we tend to, tend to put things in bins, and sometimes, you know, by necessity, research is that way as well. And so, um, again, this type of effort that we're seeing here in getting people to communicate is going to be important. The, um, I think uh, um, Dr. Henry said this is a multidimensional issue and needs to be solved in a multidisciplinary way, and I think that's absolutely correct. Another point I want to make is there's a lot of retailer supply chain sustainability ch st standards being developed, and maybe there's too many. Um, they tend to be multidimensional. They, these types of standards tend to be more nimble, nimble than the regulations and, and perhaps the science. In, in my observation, these uh, sustainability standards being put out on, on, the, on the retail chain, they tend to make everything a priority. And, um, uh, environmentally, as I've said, this is a real challenge, and we need to be careful and hopefully communicate and help them to use science to balance those uh, competing environmental issues. Okay, so that's, um, that's all I had. I think that, um, again, taking models like uh, Dr. Rotz was talking about and helping to make them better, get better data, and um, to help us make better sustainable, more sustainable decisions on, on the farm level is going to be really important for our children's future. Thanks.